Um, hi, I'm Kevin Rogers, Director of Reasonable Faith Adelaide. Tonight, Jeff Russell will speak um, on God's Dilemma, Holiness and Love. So Jeff is a professional electrical engineer who's now, now mainly retired and is also a valuable member of the Reasonable Faith Adelaide Committee. So thank you, Jeff, and I now hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Kevin, and uh, good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen who might be viewing this meeting by Zoom from all manner of locations. And I welcome later viewers too, who might see this uh, when it's uploaded onto YouTube uh, where it can be seen from here on. God's dilemma, holiness and love. How can God have a dilemma? How is that possible? Well, I'll make things clear from the outset uh, where I'm starting from. Uh, in my address, I'll be talking about the Judeo-Christian God, the God who's revealed himself in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament taken together. Uh, the one I believe is the one true God. I'm assuming his existence and I'm assuming the validity of the Bible as his holy and inspired written word. Of course, all these points are challenged and I'm prepared to debate every one of them but uh, not here and now. So this then is my starting point. I'll just present, first of all, a brief outline of what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, look at the question of whether God can do anything. I'm going to consider um, what a dilemma is. Then we're going to look at um, the two aspects that I've captured in our title of the address. First of all, the love of God. And then secondly, the holiness of God and show then how there is a dilemma between those two attributes of God and how the dilemma is resolved in the cross of Christ and then draw everything to a conclusion. So how can God have a dilemma? Isn't God omnipotent? That means all powerful. He can do anything, can't he? And there's nothing he can't do isn't there? It's almost true, but not quite. God could make an elephant appear and not just appear, he could actually make a real live elephant stand right in front of you right now if he chose to do that. Yes, he can do that. He could transfer you instantly to the moon's surface, enable you to live there, and um, view things without any necessary breathing apparatus, and then return you safely to uh, where you are right now. Yes, he can do that. But God cannot do anything that is inconsistent with his character. His character that he has revealed to us. For instance, it is impossible for God to lie. And now I want to look at what the Bible tells us um, about some of these things. We learn this from the Bible in the New Testament uh, letter of, to the Hebrews, chapter 6, and verses 17 and 18. The writer there refers to the unchanging nature of God's purpose, and he says, it is impossible for God to lie. And this isn't something that that writer just made up. It's uh, the entire Bible tells us the same thing very often from the words of God himself. And in uh, the Old Testament, back in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, one of the books of Moses early on in the Bible, uh, God reveals to Moses, he says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? The answer to those two questions, rhetorical questions really are, is an emphatic no. Whenever he speaks, he does act according to what he's spoken. And when he promises, he does fulfill his promises. So we can have confidence in God uh, and in, that he will do as he has said and he does not lie. And furthermore, once again, in, uh, in the New Testament now, in Paul's letter to uh, his colleague Titus, his Christian colleague and fellow elder Titus, he writes, uh, God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time certain things that are going to come to pass. And through these uh, quotations I've brought to your attention, there's an emphasis on the fact that God does not lie. He cannot lie. Uh, he uh, always acts in accordance with, his, um, with what he has said. 
Now, just an interesting aside here at this point, um, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, uh, the three great world um, monotheistic religions, uh, all of them state their fundamental belief that God is omnipotent, he is all powerful. But Jews and Christians um, together qualify that statement in just the, the way I've mentioned that he, God will not do anything inconsistent with his revealed character. While Muslims say that God can lie, he literally can do anything in their estimation. Anyway, we'll continue to consider the God of Bible revelation. So yes, God is omnipotent with the qualifications I've just stated. But not only is God omnipotent, he is also omniscient. That means all knowing. He knows everything. Nothing's hidden from him he, in time or space or in any other way. He knows the end from the beginning. Furthermore, he's omnipresent as well. That means that he's consciously present everywhere. There's nowhere where he is not present and his presence is necessary everywhere, uh, including every atom for anything material to exist at all. Fourthly, he's eternal. He has no beginning, he has no end. He exists from everlasting to everlasting. And then one more thing, he has no rival or peer anywhere. So given all that, that God is uh, omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's eternal, and he has no, no peer, he's peerless. How can God possibly have a dilemma? Well, what is a dilemma? My iPhone uh, dictionary, I'm not quite sure of the source of that, but I do acknowledge the dictionary that I regularly use on my iPhone, I value it very much, gives the following two meanings, as well as a formal logic meaning, which I'll omit. Firstly, a dilemma is a situation requiring a choice between equally undesirable alternatives. Secondly, a dilemma is a difficult or perplexing situation or problem. Now, the title of our address uh, this evening gives an indication that God's dilemma has to do with his two attributes of love and holiness, two essential attributes. They're fundamental attributes, and initially we'll consider both of them one after the other in isolation. We'll consider love first because we human beings think we know what love is and we think that'll be easy to understand. And so let's deal with that first. Holiness is a bit more difficult for us. What does the Bible tell us about love and specifically about the love of the, as it relates to God? The statement, God is love, is well known. It appears quite late in the Bible, in fact, not far from the end. It's in the first letter of John the Apostle, chapter 4, and verse 8, right near the end. And then it's repeated again in verse 16, God is love. Um, this is a New Testament statement. It's not explicitly stated in the Old Testament, but I believe that the Old Testament does teach the very same thing. So I want to look a little bit now at uh, some things in the Old Testament that indicate just as much that God is love. Note that uh, before I do that, before I get into those Old Testament quotations, I want to say a little bit more about this simple uh, three word sentence, God is love. Note that it doesn't say God is loving, even though that is true too. If it said that, we could understand that God is acting in love on a specific occasion, but leave us wondering whether he'll act in love on a different occasion. Even if we understood that God is loving on all occasions, that is God is always loving, it would mean that God in his thoughts, words and deeds conforms to some standard external to himself, the standard or ideal that we call love. God is love, that statement, implies that he himself sets the standard. Everything he thinks, says and does is loving. He cannot but love. Note, secondly, that the quotation there does not say love is God. 
nor is it to be taken as an equation that God equals love. Both these would result in a philosophical idol whereby some idea is personified and deified. No, it says God is love. That is the personal, conscious, communicating, purposeful God is love. He always loves. He cannot but love. When we put it that way, God cannot but love, given that God is love, we see another way in which God's omnipotence is qualified, that there are actually things he cannot do, as I've already stated. God cannot but love. We human beings may not see it that way. People may say of God's actions that a specific action of his is not uh, an action of love, especially when we see God punishing a person or when he causes a natural disaster um, that has uh, resulting injuries or fatalities. But when we consider these things, other people will respond that God allows or permits certain things, but does not actually cause them. This uh, thinking really gets nowhere. Uh, in a way, God causes absolutely everything to happen. Anything that happened, God caused it. Always, he could have made it happen differently. And in any case, there's plenty of references in the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, that clearly say that God punishes people and that he does cause natural disasters. When human beings challenge God that his actions do not result from love, they are applying their own standard of love and working within their own time frame too. They're endeavoring to subject God to their human standard, whereas God sets the standard and his view is far greater than ours and his time frame is different too. In the end, all those human beings that remain, the blessed ones, we will see truly that God is love. Let's consider a bit further what God loves. And here it is. I want to uh, use some Old Testament quotations. I think that the record of creation in Genesis 1, though it does not use the word love, shows that God loves everything he made. There's a repeated phrase uh, beginning in verse 4 of chapter 1 and repeated in verses 10, 12, 18, 21 and 25 after each successive uh, act of creation. It says after that act was uh, finished, that God saw that it was good. And then finally, when the whole work is complete and uh, the day of rest comes, not that God needs rest like we do, um, but you can sense a, a satisfaction, a delight in, in, what he's, um, in what he's finished, it reads in verse 31 of Genesis 1, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. This feeling of delight and of satisfaction comes out uh, further in a, another Old Testament passage in the book of Job, um, where God tells about the time of creation in chapter 38, verse 7. He says in a poetic way, the morning stars sang together at that time and all the angels shouted for joy, those who'd been about God's creative work, his agents. So you can get a sense of um, God's joy in that, his love. He loved all that he had made. Um, we look on a bit further in the Psalms um, where we read statements like this from Psalm 119, verse 64, the earth is filled with your love, O Lord. And yes, it was, and it still is. It is filled with God's love. He loves what he has made. And verse five of Psalm 33, um, we read the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Now, notice that last reference, all those of Old Testament quotations, that last reference uh, introduced a, an adjective, unfailing for love. And that's important. It's God's constant love, his never-ending love. Um, but it also, that Psalm 33 verse 5, also introduced a new subject as well to do with morality in this uh, case and leads and links to uh, the next um, part of our address says the Lord loves righteousness 
and justice too. These are other things that he loved. Um, Psalm 6 verse 4, because of this and its relationship to morality, the people who do relate to God can rely on his unfailing love. They call out to them. They call out to him to save them. Save me because of your unfailing love. And they seek comfort in God's love too, even in trying circumstances. May your unfailing love be my comfort. So um, um, God's, God does love all that he has made and he loves a certain other things as well um, very, very much in, an un, in a constant way. But just by, con, uh, by contrast with that, we note Psalm 5 verse 5 where it says, you hate all who do wrong. Already there, we're getting a little indication of where this might be heading. Now let's consider God's holiness on the next slide. I have some further um, quotations which I'd like to bring to your attention. God is holy. This too is a consistent message of the Bible from beginning to end. The first Bible reference that I can find that states this fact is in the book of Leviticus, uh, the third book of the Bible, one of the books of Moses, Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, for, where for the first time it says, uh, I am the Lord your God, be holy because I am holy. So right from the start in introducing the subject of God's holiness, there's a, an instruction to his people. This is his people Israel, his, his uh, redeemed people whom he's saved and rescued out of Egypt. Um, but he's instructing them, he's directing them that they are to be holy. And the reason is that it's because God himself is holy. Uh, this uh, um, statement is repeated again in Leviticus 19 verse 2. And it's quoted by the Apostle Peter in the New Testament in his first letter at chapter 1 and verse 16. So, and where it's applied not just to Israel after the flesh, but the spiritual Israel, that is all those who are followers are, and who of Jesus, who put their faith and, and uh, confidence in Jesus and are believers, Christian believers. The instruction is to be holy because God is holy. It goes from the beginning of the Bible to the end. Now, um, what does the word holy mean? Well, actually, in essence, it means to be set apart from everything else, to be consecrated or sacred. In, and in particular, with regard to morality, it implies a separation from everything that is wrong, sinful, evil, harmful. And so it means things like this. It means righteous, upright, just, pure, good. God is completely good with nothing detracting from that goodness. And he's like that eternally. He's perfect, as Jesus said in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, um, in the midst of his um, address to his disciples there, he tells them and us, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Notice how similar that is to the expression back there in Leviticus, be holy because I am holy, says God. Perfection and holiness are kind of the same thing, really. Our Heavenly Father, God, the Lord, he is holy and he's perfect. And he, so we are called to be holy and perfect as well. It gives an idea of, of what is, in, is intended for um, uh, holiness. Oops, sorry, I've just um, lost where my screen. Um, let me just do that again. Um, share screen. Cool. <laughs> okay, I trust everyone can see that again. Uh, this is slide number six. Um, so um, I now want to refer to God's law. Well, God's law tells us what it means for us to live holy lives that accord with God's holiness. This law is summarized in the Ten Commandments, which are recorded in the Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, and repeated again in Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 to 21. There's laws that relate to our 
um, relationship to God and there's laws which relate to our relationship with human beings all around us um, and tell us what it means to be holy. It's even more briefly uh, summarized in just two commandments that Jesus drew attention to when he said, um, quoting the Old Testament, he first of all quoted from Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, where it says, this is the number one commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And the second commandment, which Jesus said is, um, is equal with that, is to love your neighbor as yourself. He quoted from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. So that's a very high calling uh, to be holy as God is holy. Now, I just want to draw your attention to a um, very notable vision that was granted to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah about 700 years before Christ. And it's recorded in, his, uh, in it's the sixth chapter of his book, uh, verses one to four initially. So let me just uh, read that to you. That In the year that King Isaiah died, it was quite a significant time in the life of um, the kingdom of Israel, which Isaiah was a member. King Isaiah died, and he, uh, this is a vision that Isaiah saw. He said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. This is to, something to comfort him and to give him strength at this uh, particular time. And the seraphs, their heavenly beings, something like angels, uh, and glorious beings, and um, they were there and they were constantly, incessantly calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, of these heavenly beings, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, this is all um, a vision that Isaiah had and he found it... Um, uh, very confronting and very uh, comforting at the same time to, to realize in this uh, visionary way just how holy um, God is and was, was and is. Um, God only ever does what is right, what is good. He never does anything evil, anything wrong. So up to this point in time in what I've presented, there's really no problem. There's no dilemma. God is love. We've considered that. And God is holy. But now we get something, some sense of the dilemma here when we look at what Isaiah's reaction is to this. Remember that Isaiah himself was a very good man. He was a prophet of God, spokesman of God for the people, very significant prophet too. And his immediate response on receiving this uh, amazing vision is recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. So continuing on that quotation on that slide there, he says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. There's a great confrontation there to be to, be, to see more clearly than ever before the holiness of God made him aware of his own uncleanness, his own unholiness, and the uncleanness and unholiness of all the people that he was amongst. And uh, so it was a frightening thing for him. Um, and this accords with what another Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk, writes in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Your eyes, God, he says, are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So God's dilemma actually arises from us human beings whom he created. All God's creative works, all his creative acts have been done in love. The pinnacle of his creative work is the creation of human beings, us, made in his own image, as we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Being made in his own image is not a matter of our physical appearance, um, but it, um, this is actually a subject that has um, 
puzzled and delighted and intrigued commentators all down through the centuries. But it does include a, a range of attributes like the following, our ability to think and to reason, including about abstract things, our ability to communicate to the degree that we do, to organize things, to manage and control, uh, to design and construct. Now, though we are like the other animals in many respects, it is these things and others like them that distinguish humanity from the rest of the animals. And God intended that human beings, the peak of his creation, should glorify him, thank him, honour him and love him always, giving him satisfaction and delight. This would mean being aware of God's demands and obeying them and conforming to his will, not just here and there, but always. However, human beings from the start have chosen to rebel against God and to do their own thing. Should I say our own thing? God has given each of us free will so that we've been free to choose. And universally, we've chosen badly. This is the core of God's dilemma. God loves everything that he has made, including us, especially us. God's love would have him warmly embrace us. But human beings have disobeyed him, refused to live holy lives, so dishonouring him. God's holiness, on the other hand, would have us firmly punished, actually wiped out. And here's the dilemma. How can a, the holy God love us when we have so insulted him, so dishonoured him, our creator? On the other hand, how can the loving God implement the just result of his holiness, that is, our destruction? What a dilemma. It's a cosmic, like a dilemma of cosmic proportions. We get an inkling of this from the book of the Old Testament prophet Hosea. And here I'll just go back uh, to slide number three. And at the bottom, I've added a little quotation there from the book of the Old Testament prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verse 8. Uh, and what we uh, see there, there's been 10 previous chapters with themes of, of God's love and his holiness um, alternating as he deals with his ancient covenant people of Israel in all their wickedness and how God is really tried with all this um, and uh, provoked. And finally, God says to Hosea in this quotation, he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? He's contemplating the just consequences of God's holiness, that it would mean giving them up. That means up to judgment, up to uh, destruction, all the things that, um, that ought to come upon them for their wickedness. But he says, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over Israel to these things? He says, my heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. And here we can see the tension between God's love on the one hand and his holiness on the other hand, his dilemma. Human beings are generally keen to talk about God's love and its implications. We, people generally don't have much of a problem in expressing themselves about all those things. But also generally, human beings are very often dismissive of God's holiness as though that doesn't matter. That if, that's of no concern. That's all um, um, imagination. Are dismissive of God's holiness and all its implications, but they're just as significant, just as important, just as fundamental to God as his love. Is it reasonable of God to require us to be holy as he is holy? Now, God, of course, does not need me to defend him, um, but nonetheless, here's my answer. Yes, it is reasonable for God to require this. And here's why. God created us. 
We are totally dependent on him for everything, every breath even, every heartbeat. And we can do nothing of ourselves. It's only as he enables us. We don't really create or make anything. We actually just use God's materials, which he created, and all of which have inherent properties that he gave them. And even when we think about our thoughts and our ability to design things, oops, sorry, I've done that again. Um, can cover that. Even when we think about our ability uh, to design things, uh, to construct things, to, to manage things, and even our, our perception about things, uh, our, our senses uh, are all from him. They're all as he enables, uh, he, as he enables it. Um, we only perceive something, we only think of something, we only use our muscles, etc., as God enables. We're totally dependent on God and he alone creates. We are simply his creatures. He's made us for something. So that's one aspect. Secondly, everything else that he's created actually does glorify him. The stars, the planets, etc., in the heavens, they all constantly give glory to God. Inanimate things on earth like oceans, mountains, rivers, rocks, etc., it all gives glory to God all the time. All the vegetation in its incredible variety, the entire animal creation in all its amazing uh, variety, except for human beings, all the animal creation, it, it all gives glory to God nonstop. God has no dilemma with anything else. He made it all and it all fulfills perfectly the purpose he had in making it. It glorifies him continually. But human beings, the very pinnacle of God's creative work, are out of step with the rest. We don't give God glory. We don't give him delight. We are the problem. God's dilemma is resolved in the cross of Christ. And that's what the whole Bible really is about. It really is um, centering on the, the coming of Jesus into the world. And the center of all that is him going to the cross and dying on the cross and being raised again. And God's dilemma is resolved in this way. Jesus is the answer. Of course, the verse I've quoted there, John chapter 3, verse 16, is very well known. I would think still, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's uh, very well known, but I would like to refer uh, to its context because we need to see what is it, we need to know a bit more about what does it mean to believe in him and what does it mean that God gave his son. Let me read a bit more from John chapter 3, and I'll read from verse 14 to the end of that section. These are the words of Jesus from verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, here is referring to the ancient Israel history of their um, rescue from Egypt. Moses lifted up the snake in the desert in a critical moment and they have saved the people. So the son of man must be lifted up. Here Jesus is referring in an enigmatic way and very, very briefly, he's referring to his impending death on the cross, to his crucifixion. He's going to be lifted up to and people are going to not necessarily physically look at him, but they need to look to him in a spiritual way. He must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then the verses that follow, they may be Jesus' words or they may be the inspired words of John, you know, the Apostle John who wrote this gospel, but they're very, very uh, important to attach to all this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. It's the end of that section. There's a lot that comes in that that I haven't got um, the uh, time or opportunity here to expound. But we can see that um, God is about uh, this work He's doing through his one and only son um, to save um, human beings, to save the world. And yet there's a division there between those who believe and those who do not believe. Those who believe in him and in his saving work, um, his giving himself on the cross, uh, they're, they're distinguished from those who do not believe. Okay, um, let's move on uh, with this. Um, this is it all centers on the death of Christ and in particular his death on the cross. I can't now go into all that it means to believe in him. It needs a great deal of expansion. Now, I do want to just say this though, that in one way of speaking, as in this Bible passage, God sent his son. Into, he sent his son into the world. He gave his son in this way. But in another way of speaking, uh, that's just as important to uh, appreciate. God came himself and gave himself. This is hard for us to get our minds around, but it's true and it's very important because God and Jesus are completely together in this work and the cost is to them both, not to one and not the other, but to them both. In one way, Jesus was the ultimate prophet of God, his final spokesperson, God's perfect representative. But in another remarkable way, he is God with us. So I won't go further into that at this stage. I just want to show that uh, there's no separation in that sense uh, in, in purpose or in cost uh, between uh, God the Father and his son. Now, the Old Testament prophet Joel, um, long before the time of Christ, in his little book, he wrote these words in chapter 2, verse 32. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And here again, we have a very succinct statement that encapsulates the way that God will bring human beings to himself in right relationship, in loving embrace. It's for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. This too needs a great deal of expansion, which I, I can't do here and now. Notice that it's um, that it's for it could could be for everyone. It's available to everyone, but it is but it is only for those who actually do call on the name of the Lord. They're the ones who are saved. And this statement by Joel is picked up um, because it's authoritative. It's picked up by the Apostle Peter. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, in the very early days of the Christian church. And then again by the Apostle Paul as he writes his very powerful letter to the Romans, to the Romans, sometimes called the gospel, according to Paul. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. There's this both of those um, characters uh, quote the um, provingly, they quote this statement from Joel. So it kind of is a succinct way of to saying God about God's saving action. Everyone calls on the name of the Lord uh, will be saved. Um, now just uh, um, just notice there how they correspond. There's a correspondence between that and what I had quoted previously uh, from the Apostle John. So it's um, here it's um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord in Joel back before it was whoever believes in Jesus Christ. They're really the different ways of saying the same things. And on the other hand, will be saved is the same as not perishing but have eternal life. You can see there's a correspondence there too. So consistent message. <clears throat> what did the cross achieve? Essentially, Jesus died for us. He took our sins and guilt upon himself 
and bore the just consequences of that he bore it himself so that we might be relieved set free forgiven that's uh, in a nutshell and uh, the apostle peter puts it this way in his first letter at chapter 2 verse 24 he says he himself that is jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree that is the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed and in that last um, little bit he's he's uh, picking up um, sayings from the old testament particularly from isaiah which i won't go into but you can say what an what an incredible understatement that is by his wounds christ's wounds well that's the wounds of um, all that he suffered in his passion and his crucifixion uh, it's far more than just wounds and you have been healed well it's far more than just um, healing of uh, some a, a cough or a scratch or something it's actually being transferred from death to life itself and eternal life at that what a what an understatement but that's the essence of uh, the gospel truth um, that that's holding out for us the promise of uh, salvation of of being saved um jesus lived a completely holy life utterly pure and sinless his death on the cross exposes what sin does what it's capable of and what it actually does all sin every sin it would humiliate a completely innocent man to the point of crucifixion that brutal crucifixion it shows the depth of sin in all human beings because the entire human race was and is responsible for the death of Christ. He only died because of us. Secondly, the cross shows us what sin deserves in view of the holiness of God. All sin, every sin, a person who sins, every person who sins deserves such an end. It's a very sobering thought. But thirdly, the cross shows us the love of God, how far God was prepared to go. God was prepared to go to that extent, that of giving his one and only beloved son, of giving himself in that dreadful way for us, just for us, to recover us from our fallen state to himself, to glory. The cross of Christ displays both the love and the holiness of God. The benefits deriving from the cross are available to every human being, but are effective only in those who truly know God and who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us what will happen in the end. It's in a wider context, but I've just extracted and the most relevant verses here it's in his second letter to the church at thessalonica chapter 1 verses 8 to 10. he writes about how everything will be concluded one day still yet to come but not far off he says he is referring to jesus uh, acting for god he says he will punish those who do not know god and do not obey the gospel of our lord jesus they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at uh, among all those who have believed. And that will bring everything uh, to its proper goal, the, the end of all God's creative work. And finally, God will be all in all. And this is the outcome of God's justice of his holiness on one hand and his love on the other and uh, that's the they worked together now the subject of my address this evening is not just an academic issue it has vital implications for you and for me indeed for all human beings so don't let this issue rest until you've come to know god as paul writes there to know god and to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Now, in conclusion, I'll just summarise what I've put before you in this slide. And so we've got five points here. First of all, 
God is love. He loves everything he has made. That is literally everything. Secondly, God is holy. He's completely just and pure. So he cannot tolerate any evil, even a single sin. Thirdly, we human beings, the very pinnacle of God's creation, are all sinners and we deserve his wrath, that is destruction. Fourthly, God has resolved his dilemma by sending his son Jesus to us. At immense cost, he paid the price for all who come to him. There was no other way. Finally, fifthly, the cross of Christ shows God's love and holiness and is the means by which God's glory will finally fill heaven and earth. Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, for your presentation. And so... Um, People, you can be free to unmute your microphones and, and now open the session for um, discussions and questions. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll probably uh, first refer to uh, what's happened on the chat line. Uh, and Rod, you uh, wrote a, a fair bit. Would you actually like to speak to what you've written in the chat? Okay. I noticed that, you know, Jeff, you, you seem to accept the traditional view of omniscience, that God knows absolutely everything. And I assume by that you mean even from the eternal past, God knows the eternal future. Yes, I Would do. Would that be correct? Yep. yep. Yeah. I, I have a, a slightly different view. I think that God knows the, the past perfectly. He knows the present, future he has a good idea about the future because he can see our hearts and our minds and what we're thinking in all our details. There are no secret thoughts that we can hide from God in that sense. But I do think there is a sense in which God is surprised uh, and uh, taken aback. For example, in the great flood that's reported in Genesis, uh, it is said that God repented the created man. Now, I see this as a genuine sense of regret that God had, that if he had his time over again, there's that sense that he wouldn't have created us at all because of the extent of the evil. Um, so repentance ha has that connotation of significant regret, mm -hmm. uh, whereas if he exhaustively knows absolutely everything from beginning to end, that to me suggests, well, there's not really a room for surprise in that. Uh, uh, so that's what I would say that and if you want to know more about that view it's called openness to God theology um, and I'm not saying for example it doesn't undermine prophecy because prophecy is largely about what God will do uh, for example the coming of Christ he promised that it's not so much foreknowledge about but his faithfulness to his promises I see that as a, in a different category so I think there is an element in which God is surprised. Uh, yeah. say, uh, go on in. Um, go on. Yeah, um, I'm, I was. I'm thinking if if uh, if the future doesn't exist yet, so to speak, because of our free will and because things might happen differently because of our free will, that um, that would be one way. One thought that you might say would lead to the idea that God therefore doesn't know everything in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we don't exist yet in time, then our thoughts not really, are really not there to be known. Uh, yeah, so but God, God is outside time. God is beyond time. Uh, so to him, uh, uh, he knows uh, everything in the future, just like he knows everything in the past. I actually think, um, you know, that could be interesting to talk about these things, but it tends to get very philosophical. I know it does say things like God repented and he changed his mind, and maybe that's a topic that could be taken up another time, Kevin, um, that, that, that whole issue. I actually think that things like that are uh, a bit like anthropomorphism, you know. It talks about God having eyes. He sees things. He has his hands. Um, and there's quite a lot of other things like that to God's heart. Well, you know, God is spirit and he doesn't literally have things like we have, but it's written that way 
uh, it, it's kind of helpful for us to understand uh, how that God does perceive things and how he does move things and everything. But he doesn't literally have eyes and uh, ears and uh, hands and, and so on, does he? So they're what you call, that's an anthropomorphic, what do you call it? Anthropomorphic. Um, anthropomorphic. Yeah, uh, that, that, thank you, Brian. Uh, that, that kind of uh, thing. And I actually think that this um, state, these statements about God repenting uh, and changing his mind are along those ways. I don't think anything, nothing at all surprises God, and nothing at all. Um, and he does know um, what's going to happen from the beginning. And so that, you know, in the Garden of Eden, there's already uh, indications there quite clearly that God is going to send um, a saviour who will sacrifice himself for the human race. It's right back there, right at the very beginning um, in several areas. So it didn't that, need... That's God's solution to evil, I would say, yeah. which he would which, he resolved correct. to have. That, that's correct. Um, so he's not surprised by anything, so, in my view. The New Testament calls Jesus uh, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so sure. right from at the point of creation, it was known what was going to happen. And the other problem, of course, is, as you mentioned, Jeff, that God is outside of time. That is something that we simply cannot get our heads around. And so we have to, has to, have to find some other form of language to express that. Um, that can't really express something that it's inexpressible to us. That's right. And so I think in lots and lots of ways, um, there's, there has to be an accommodation to as, as clever as human beings are, and as amazing as he has made us with our faculties and our abilities, we still are human beings. Uh, we're still way, way less than him. And he needs to put things in ways that we can uh, comprehend. And I think that's in that category. Um, so I, I couldn't really agree uh, with that. I, I do think there are statements in the Bible that um, we do do stretch us and, you know, we wonder, well, what does that really mean and how does this add up with this? And so, you know, that's quite fair enough. But uh, to, to me, you know, I'd have to say God is great and uh, he's just way beyond us. Jeff, does, one, that, one can, sorry. Uh, uh, Jeff, does that mean you uh, believe that God is not locked into the present but it transcends time? And so yes. even though we really do make choices and have freedom of will, uh, yeah. God, God knows where the choices go. That's right. Mm. And, and this too is, um, this is another thing too. This is a whole issue about election uh, and yet um, people's culpability in the choices they make. Uh, they are both, they're both there. And that's another uh, thing that we never finally get our heads around. We puzzle over that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's what I think anyway. Yeah, absolutely with you, 100% there, Jeff. Uh, one of the rare occasions when I totally agree. <laughs> well, thank you, Gordon. Um, it's, yeah, my, it's, my, it's, my response to that is sometimes I think we try to solve difficult issues by appealing too much to mystery. Uh, and that's my that, concern, that, that, that there will hold something to be mm -hmm. valid and we just appealed a mystery to solve it, and I'm not always satisfied with that uh, sort of an answer. I don't think there's anything mysterious about it. Uh, the creator cannot be bound by his own creation. Well, and I, 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 I disagree because I think we can, we can yeah. hold the irreconcilable together by appealing to mystery. I actually, but I actually do think there are mysteries, and uh, that word is used in the in the Bible. But your, your point's true, uh, valid. Uh, that you know, we don't want to just say throw our hands up, say, "Oh, well, it's just a mystery," and you just got to accept that. We can actually wrestle with these things, and it can pay us to wrestle with these things. That's true. But in the end, I think there's a lot of things that are just beyond even the cleverest human being. Uh, I don't see any reason why there should be a problem here. Okay, God is outside time and space. You can see the whole picture from beginning to end, right from the start. Right. Uh, what, what's so difficult about that? I'm not so sure that I would accept that argument. Uh, needs unpack quite a bit. Uh, well, I God got, certainly I... acts in time. Uh, when you say outside of time, what does that mean? in the sense that he's not affected by the contingencies of time, like we are, death and sickness, uh, et cetera. Um, 
he transcends time in that sense, but to what degree he acts out of, uh, out of time is another issue. Well, I, th I think um, we have to acknowledge that there's some very smart people who differ on this. And uh, so, oh, by, yes, there's, yeah. there's, uh, I've got a five, I've got a book called, was it Five Views of God in Time or something? Yeah. It's quite okay. a uh, controversial, difficult topic. Yes. Well, that could be interesting to read. <laughs> I was thinking that too. All right. Is there people who'd like to raise other issues? Uh, I'd like to comment a bit about the uh, being made in the image of God question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I think that's important to see is humans are different <coughs> from all the created um, creatures in that we are made in the image of Christ. And so Christ is got aspects in his uh, form that we mirror and because of sin they're all distorted but it's very important to see we're in the image of Christ and uh, Christ has uh, certain attributes involving uh, you know arms legs head so his incarnation is into a human form and then with his resurrection he's raised into a more glorified body, but he's still got a glorified body that has a head and arms and feet. And that's the body we relate to in heaven. So it's very important to get this picture that the plan is that we are actually restored back to the original intent that we are carbon copies of Christ. And the Hebrew word for the image of God is very similar to the Hebrew word in modern Israel for photocopying. So that's the dynamic we have to see. It's part of the plan that that's where it's headed in terms of eternity. Yeah. Yeah, but in terms of Jesus, I mean, he became man, didn't he? So he was actually made to be like us in that in that, that sense. But I think that image is um, it's far more, it's much more about other things than it is about appearance. Uh, Jesus was made... He can, he's the word made flesh. So when he was made flesh, then he, be, he looked just like us. And, you know, the whole of his life from babyhood to manhood, um, he's just like every one of us. Um, um, but um, you know, but I'm God, saying the other way around, Jeff, is that we are in his image. Yeah, but don't you think that's referring to spiritual things? Um, we, we're no, no, physical and spiritual. There's a dynamic in the way humans are intended in their creation, and we're destined to a final fulfilment. I, I remember one preacher here in Adelaide said, in the final scheme of things, there's very little difference between us as redeemed, resurrected human beings and Christ in heaven. There's a, there's a marriage analogy of you know yeah. the bride and the bridegroom it's very powerful imagery being portrayed here it's not uh, out of place to see that there's that mirroring going on yeah okay yeah i think the um, the spiritual things are much more important uh, and i also think you you mentioned about like carbon copy uh i didn't particularly like that thought um God actually delights in all the variety that he's made. We can see that in everything about us, you know, um, in, in the rest of the animal creation and vegetation and everything. That's part of the delight of his creation. And I'm sure that God delights in that. So I don't think he wants us all to be carbon copies either, you know. No, the carbon copy is the exact reflection of something. That's what a carbon copy is. Yeah. It copies something that's real. Yeah, but don't you think that expression there, I think you're referring to something that um, Paul wrote, isn't it, about beholding his glory from being transformed from one degree of glory to another and so on. That's about spiritual things. It's nothing to do yeah, with you know, physical it's true, But it's also physical. So in Genesis, when it talks about the Lord God walking in the garden, talking to Adam, that yeah. is a real person talking to another real person with conversation and uh there's a there's a harmony there reflecting yeah. the, the purposes of God. And in the final scheme, 
because of the resurrection, we're destined to the same uh, reflection down the track. Okay. You're on mute. Yep. Uh, I actually find it fascinating that uh, Paul goes to the extent of um, saying, imitate me. <laughs> so it's a pretty bold sort of statement to make. Yeah. Once again, that must, that's nothing to do with physical things, is it? He's not talking about that. He's talking about um, his motivation in life and his... Um, is living out the um, the fruit of the spirit, um, this this sort of thing. His care for people, you know, he wants us to imitate him in that way, not to imitate how he dresses or how he looks uh, or anything. Yeah, in that context, is from Philippians two. Uh, he says that um, he'd lost all things, and um, he'd uh, count them as rubbish, and he wants to yeah. share in Christ's sufferings. <laughs> Uh, and it's all very confronting. And then he's thinking, oh, that's all right for you, Paul. But then he comes out and mucks it up and says, imitate me. <laughs> yeah. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Jeff, on another point, um, you said that we've all got uh, a free will, correct? Yes. Yeah. And at the same time, same time God causes everything to happen that should happen. Is that right? That uh, predetermines yes. everything. Yeah. Where how does do it actually those, <laughs> how do you reconcile those two concepts? Because I see a lot that happens in our world. I can't see how God's hand is behind it. There's a lot of evil hmm. for what it is. And I'm not sure that it that does that. actually say that we have free will, but it, 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 without no, no, denying but it, yeah. But that was the belief yeah. that you had, though, isn't it? Free will. We all have. I think you said that well, earlier. You exactly your... say that. Yeah, God has given us free will, and constantly yes. there are calls for people, you know, right through the Bible, to exercise that free will in the right way. He says, you know, you know, I set before you life and death, you know, the way of God and the way of uh, the world. Choose life, you know, there's, there's that constant sure. kind of uh, encouragement. But and the you, word is how do you reconcile that with the idea that God predetermines everything? Um, yeah, well, that, that's another with it's great a mystery. difficulty. <laughs> it's a mystery, Rod. <laughs> well, one, one way that I sort of view this is that. Uh, yes, there is a sense in which all of creation uh, does testify to the Lord, but that's a matter of, of faith. Um, the, the world itself, the actual, all that was good in the creation, uh, and it was good until humans came along, and, and then it was very good. Uh, but all that was good implies to me that the, the physical world is morally neutral. Uh, in which, uh, and it's only in a morally neutral universe that you can have free will, it seems to me. That's true. So that all the animals, um, they actually just act in accordance with their instinct, which God has made it that way. So yeah. in a sense, they they don't have, um, there's, no, there's no choice with them. They can't exercise, they can't choose to do wrong. This no, doesn't exist for them. The moral, we're, talking human, we're talking about freedom in in the context of humans, not other creatures. I've actually yeah. spent quite some time on that one, and all it's done is hurt my brain. Um, yeah. One idea that I've heard suggested, which is purely analogy, it's not to say this is how it is, but it's a little bit helpful, is that of an author writing a fiction story. And so the author has total control over everything that is done, and yet inside the story itself, the people have total freedom to choose how they do what they do. So it's a two-level thing that way. I'm not saying that's how it is, but that is the best that I've heard to help picture it. I mean, I, I personally don't like any Calvinist uh, attempt to explain it because I, I don't think they can, even if you read their materials, like they find that they have a great deal of difficulty holding the two concepts. Everything is predetermined. So nothing happens that God doesn't cause. I mean, Calvinists, I have to say, 
you read the writings of John Kelvin, he's extremely consistent. Yeah. Um, I have to agree, he's extremely consistent. Even natural uh, events, uh, they're ultimately caused by God. So all the natural disasters and so on that happen, uh, and he thinks everything that happens to us happens for a reason. So if, say, if a, it's terrible, if a mother was murdered or a person was murdered, what sins did they commit to deserve that, he asks. You know, um, and I have to say, if God predetermines everything, it's very hard to believe for myself in such a good God. I, I really struggle to reconcile the two concepts. While God is sovereign, he's also, I would argue that while God's sovereign, he doesn't control everything. And, and that's typical from our experience. There's so many things that happen in our world that God does not seem to control. Well, uh, we don't live in the world that God intended it to, as he intended it to be. But we live in a fallen world and God has, um, in the context, it's the consequences of our sinfulness, um, you know, um, initially seen in Adam and Eve, but, you know, that we all share. And so God has actually then made the world as it is with all the things that go wrong in it um, that wouldn't have been that way if there'd never been sin, my view. Um, may I just add, of course, the book of Job provides some insight there. We have... Satan asking permission to bring calamity on Job. Yeah. God says yes, but he places a limit on firstly. And I don't think God necessarily allows, uh, had given, had, had pre knowledge of all that Satan was to do. That was up to Satan to carry out. We do have that adversary, and I guess that's the other thing. God knows that Satan will do something, he doesn't necessarily know in it. Well, he may not have understood everything that Satan was going to throw at Job. He just placed the boundaries and then let it go. Yeah. So you're saying that God doesn't have exhaustive knowledge of the future? Um, that's a good question. It, it doesn't come out in Job anyway. He just says, yeah, Satan, I'll let you. It seems like you're agreeing with me. <laughs> well, look, I'm not, I'm not saying... Um, precisely that um but certainly he gave satan permission to inflict certain punishment but with a limit and we don't actually see god specifying exactly what satan would do yeah i actually um, dealt with the book of job in another uh, address a while ago yes, um, just yeah. recounting a bit of that um it does talk about satan there and what satan did but in actual fact it was what God did it all. Uh, and, you know, he, he even says it that way. God says to Satan, you incited me to do these things. So the, the power throughout is entirely God's. Um, Satan's got this idea that God yeah. allows to be implemented uh, uh, to uh, test Job. And there's a certain, there's something behind all, all this, what is in Job's horrible experience. Um, but it's actually God who does all those things. God himself acknowledges it. Job acknowledges that. Um, so, and, you know, um, it's, it's written that way to get something across to us, I think, but it's actually God doing it. Okay. Okay. Well, well, but if you've got, uh, for example, a volcano popping off and killing thousands of people in red hot volcanic ash and so on, that's just... Uh, an artifact of a morally neutral world. You can't say that there's a spiritual element to that. that that's not God doing that. That's just something that. Well, there are there are references in the scriptures where God does talk about bringing calamity to a natural oh, calamity. Sure, he people. can. He can. He does, and he uh, also brings enemies. But, he brings so, so we can't always definitively say that a natural calamity is not God caused. No, but that's because I don't know it, whether it is. Neither can we mean, say that God did it. I mean, we don't know. Can't. Nothing don't happened. Know, exactly. Yeah, but you know, Jesus said something similar as he, about a similar situation. He that this tower collapsed and killed all these people. The Tower of Siloam in the about the time of Jesus, and the point Jesus makes from that is that well, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. You know, um, because the people were they were 
quite exercised in their minds about this. So how come these people got killed? Um, were they worse? They must have been doing hidden sins or something. Yeah, yeah, was that rotten person? That's that's why they got killed. No, it's not like that at all. Just, um, you know. Yeah, this is a subject that gets, the more you go into it, the more your brain twists around and the more it curls in on itself. And it's yeah, too difficult to answer. Some of the points Rodney made, I agree totally with, but I also agree with some on the other side totally as well. Um, yeah. And a lot of these points are in total contradiction with each other. And yet I believe, agree with both of them. Um, that's right. It, it's quite that, a paradox. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I'm sorry, Rod. I have to say it is a mystery, but God both is in charge of every, absolutely everything. And secondly, every human being is culpable. They are blameworthy for everything evil that they do. And then, then they can't I mean, uh, all these issues can be variously interpreted. Uh, depends on your assumptions and what you're prepared to accept. Uh, yeah. It's not a question of... Uh, uh, saying one view is irrefutable or anything like that. Uh, uh, they've all got pros and cons about them. Yep. Hey, while there's a lull, can I just um, refer to one of the points somebody made in the chat? Uh, I don't know this person, Godwin. Uh, is Godwin still with us or not? Anyway, he, he, thanked, he said, good presentation. Thank you for that. But uh, he said, also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 4, 16. What's that about? That was about imitate me. Um, oh, okay. Because yeah. Paul says it in a few spots. Yep. Okay, so that was maybe added during our um, discussion, was it? Yes. Okay. Uh, one thing I thought of at the end, um, you uh, put the cross as as kind of a solution to love and holiness. Um, uh, I was in a group that was talking about, you know, talking through a theologian who went even further um, and says the cross is not just the sort of explanation to love and holiness, but the explanation to evil in the world uh, coexisting with God's love. And so when people were asking, and this book was written, I think around World War I, why is all this bad stuff happening? And, and the only answer he could give was, um, well, in the cross, here we've got God um, uh, suffering all this bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I know what I've said really has only scratched the surface. Um, I've half read a book which um, by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. And one day I want to read the lot um, because I think that he really, if, as much as I've read of it, he does deal very wonderfully with this whole subject. And it is vast, it really is. Um, but I, I can see enough to see that that is where God's love and holiness do come together. And that really does um, bring out uh, the depth of sin and the depth of God's love in recovering us. It, it, um, it, all, it all does, you know, we all know that it, everything focuses on the cross. And finally, God's glory will come out of it. In the low, uh, Jeff, I uh, just want to say that was an excellent um, putting together of material and uh, very well presented and very biblical, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, you've got a gift. You've got a gift uh, that's very important about the truth of Scripture and the importance of uh, those two topics that you've raised with us tonight. Well, thank you very much for your encouragement. Yeah, I, I would also say uh, I think you've encapsulated 
the gist of what Christianity is all about in, in that um, in your whole presentation. And I think in a way, um, it's a pity there weren't a lot of non-Christians watching it because I think that, that kind of presentation, I think we would uh, would be ideal for lots of non-Christians to listen to. But um, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. agree with that. Well, it I goes up on to YouTube, so yeah, there's opportunity there. Yeah. I think in our modern world in particular, but maybe it's always been like this, um, human beings um, are ready to focus on the love of God, what they think the love of God should mean. You know, basically it means you know, God accepting everybody and giving everybody what they want and, you know, doing the nice things. That's all love and people all like that. So it's easy to talk about it. But talk about holiness, nobody likes to talk about God's holiness and what that might mean. Uh, and I think it's more like more people are less able to talk about that these days than ever. Um, but maybe it has always been that way. There's an interesting because, verse in Romans 10 or 11. It says, behold, both the kindness and severity of God. <laughs> so it's a command. Yeah. <laughs> Look at both. Yeah. Mm. Well, your point's very valid, Jeff, and uh, that question. Uh, holiness is much, much harder, I think, than what it was several generations ago, yeah. where if you look at a lot of the preaching and the founding of different churches in South Australia, holiness was, you know, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness was in a lot of the chapels around Adelaide. It was uh, yeah. very important uh, part of the Christian dynamic, but uh, today it's... Uh, seems much harder to do that yeah anyway we've got to keep plugging away don't we and uh, witnessing one way or another mm. to god's love and holiness yeah um at this point um i think we'll draw the uh, meeting to uh, the recorded meeting to a close and um, just uh, open it up for unrecorded chatter afterwards. So uh, just formally th thank you very much for your presentation, um, Jeff, and um, I hope it is helpful for people here and also to others who may listen to it on YouTube. So I'll stop recording at this point.